friends. Welcome to Lindy's Magpie Reads. I'm Lindy, I read a lot, and I am going to tell you about seven books that I have finished recently. Before I get to that, uh, here's a little bit about what has been going on. On November 30th, so Thursday, we traveled to Ladysmith from Victoria. So that's roughly an hour's drive north. And the reason was they had a light up festival and uh, there was a parade, lots of colored Christmas lights turned on decorating the streets and there was fireworks. And we have a couple of friends who live there. They hosted us overnight. So it was just a chance to experience something on Vancouver Island, uh, which, you know, we are new residents in this place. And uh, yeah, had a great time. On the way back, I took some footage of uh, what the Malahat is like. Uh, this is part of the highway between Ladysmith and Victoria. I have been making pickles lately. Well, naturally fermented pickles. I don't know if that's strictly speaking a pickle if you don't use vinegar, but regardless. A month ago I made sauerkraut and yesterday I started a batch of fermented little cucumbers and preserved lemons. So I'm excited about that. I love food of all kinds and the closest bakery to where we live, it's called Fry's. On Thursday I saw that in the back, uh, a staff member there was making some kind of bread that looked like it had fruit in it and um, was taking it out of butter and putting it in sugar and I asked about that and discovered that it's that German stolen and they take your name down because it pretty much sells out every every time that they make it. So you have to have your name put down in advance. So I did, and I picked it up this morning. Oh, is it ever good? It's got candied orange peel that they make there at the bakery. It's got marzipan in it that they make at the bakery. It's got almonds, raisins, spices, and it's folded in three, which I discovered when I did some Googling. That is the traditional form uh, for stolen. I'd only seen it in a braided shape before. So I am curious, those of you who know a lot more about stolen than I do, <laughs> that doesn't take much. Let me know in the comments below what your thoughts on stolen are and if you prefer braided or folded and what kind of ingredients in it. Ah. And speaking of special pastry type things for Christmas, there were some fantastic gingerbread houses in the bakery windows in Lady Smith. I was in awe. So gorgeous. Okay. On to the reading. So I have started my short story advent calendar. I am not going to spoil the surprise for anybody who also has an advent calendar, but we are past December 1st, so I can tell you about the very first story. It's by Sam Shellstad, and the story is called Notes on the Craft of Fiction. It's actually an excerpt from a longer piece of work, a novel, called The Cobra and the Key. And this was hilarious, tongue-in-cheek, the character who's writing advice on how to write fiction. And I am going to read you just a little bit 
because I know some of you watching are fans of Marion Engel's book, Bear. Okay, here goes. If you're having trouble coming up with a title for your work, walk over to your bookshelf and peruse the spines. What titles work for you and which ones fall flat? Looking over at my own shelf, I see The Brothers Karamazov. A fantastic title. What a crazy name, Karamazov, which makes me imagine these insane brothers. I spot Infinite Jest, which suggests that the book will have no conflict and is therefore unsuccessful as a title. Better luck next time. Now I see Bear by Marion Engel. How could I not read this immediately? A bear is conflict incarnate, success. Then I come to Slaughterhouse Five, which is a curious example. The word slaughterhouse is quite good, but five makes me think I have the wrong book. Surely I need to start with the first in the series. Too confusing. Finally, my eyes fall on Flannery O'Connor's The Violent Bear It Away. I'm definitely getting Marion Angle vibes here, but while the first three words would make for an incredible title, this is spoiled by the inclusion of the last two words. I would have swapped out it away for runs amok. Yeah. Lots of fun. What a delight to have a new short story every day in December. I do have a collection of short stories to tell you about a little bit later, but I'm going to start with another funny Canadian. Oh, did I mention that Sam Shellstedt is Canadian? Well, yeah, he is. So is Rick Mercer, who is a gay Canadian comedian, well known in Canada for his television shows and I listened to his latest memoir. The first one was called Talking to Canadians and where that memoir ended was right at the point where he started a show called Rick Mercer Report. And in this book, The Road Years, a memoir, he documents 15 years of traveling across Canada to participate in all kinds of kooky things um, like bathtub races and uh, all kinds of winter sports as well as um, spending time with Canadian celebrities. He's had every men member of Rush on his show and every member of uh, The Tragically Hip, uh, Jan Arden has a whole chapter. There's a time when he went to Algonquin Park in the winter and assisted a biologist with tagging bears. Oh man, so funny. By the way, I am going to link a video below so you can watch this part of this segment if you're interested. So what Rick Mercer finds out is not all bears hibernate through the winter. Mother bears are in a sort of in-between state because they have to stay alert because they are uh, nursing their offspring and making sure that they don't wander off and um, get into trouble. So they, Rick was assisting with weigh and measure and put eardrops, I think, uh, in these baby bears that they found. He says, I'm so proud to live in a country where baby bears have universal health care. <laughs> I love Rick Mercer's sense of humor and uh, he's just got such a big warm heart. His care for people really comes through. Rick Mercer reads his own audiobook. I highly recommend it. Next up is another audiobook, also nonfiction, 
misbelief. What makes rational people believe irrational things? And it's by Dan Ariely, who's a Israeli-American social scientist. I had many takeaways from this, uh, but the one that surprised me the most is Dan Ariely's encouragement not to ostracize people who are part of your friends or family group who start spouting off conspiracy theory sorts of ideas. He explains that the reason for that is the more you ostracize someone, the more likely they are to double down on this kind of thinking and to hang out with people who believe all kinds of irrational things. So that uh, support that people get when um, through fear or frustration or for whatever reason start going down the conspiracy rabbit hole which by the way he calls he uses the description misbelief instead of conspiracy theories because it's less loaded I guess. Ariely quotes Helen's razor, which is never attribute to malice that which is adequately adequately explained by stupidity. But Ariely has reworded that to never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by human fallibility. So Ariely's recognition that we're human, we make mistakes, uh, I found really encouraging. And he also talks about his hope that society will soon realize how important trust is and that that is something we all can work on. Improving our trust in our fellow human beings before a whole bunch more damage is done with mistrust and misbelief. And he does give concrete examples on how you can build up your trust. Uh, and what do you do when you're hurt by having your trust abused? So all in all, I found this a really worthwhile audiobook. Very glad to have listened to it. So, from an Israeli American onto a Palestinian American. Now, this next book I picked up because it is Read Palestine Week. This started on November 29th and goes through to December 5th. I'm going to put a link in the show notes below because this is a Publishers for Palestine initiative and all of the publishers who are signatories on this have included free access to one of the works that they publish. So if you follow the link below, you'll be able to see which titles are there and I'm sure you'll find something to interest you because there's everything from poetry to fiction to nonfiction of all kinds and in different languages as well. Uh, this is a book that I picked up at the library. It's called Homeland, My Father Dreams of Palestine and it's by Hannah Muschebeck who uh, and it's autobiographical. The illustrations are by a Kuwaiti children's book illustrator, Reem Mado. I always love a good author's note. At the end, this one tells me, My family lived in the Kataman neighborhood in West Jerusalem until May 15, 1948. 
the day Palestinians call Al-Nakba, or the catastrophe. On this day, all my relatives, after being warned of danger, packed small bags, locked their doors, piled into my grandfather's car, and took sanctuary in the Greek Orthodox monastery next to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in East Jerusalem. They were never allowed to return to their homes, and to this day carry with them the keys to their houses, now occupied by others. As the Mukhtar, my great-grandfather was permitted to live at the convent until he died. My relatives, including my father, visited the old city of Jerusalem each summer until the 1967 war prevented them from returning. Like many refugees, the rest of my family scattered across the world. I have relatives in Chile, Peru, Canada, Switzerland, Jordan, Lebanon, and the United States. We speak different languages, we celebrate different holidays, we eat different foods, but one thing we all share, stories of our homeland. And the power of passing on stories from one generation to the next, the ability to maintain a sense of home in the heart that is different from home where you live comes through so strongly uh, the connection to heritage culture family a very touching story and it is uh, a good way i think to start a conversation with very young children who ask about palestine and speaking of immigrants and refugees. This next book, also an audiobook, is called The Racism of People Who Love You, Essays on Mixed Race Belonging, and it's by Samira Mehta. The audiobook is read by Farida Pasha. So these essays have titles like, Where Are You Really From? Meat is Murder, Failing the Authenticity Test, American Racism, Appropriation, Mentoring, and Title Essay, The Racism of People Who Love You. So Samira's father was born in a town that is now part of Pakistan. When he was born, it was part of India, and he was one of millions who had to move to a different place when the partition happened. Samira's mother is a, a white American and Samira always felt that she wasn't Indian enough when she was surrounded by other Indian Americans or when she went to India. Uh, but she also didn't feel white enough uh, in American society because of her brown skin. And she talks really well about how having a mixed heritage affects your individual identity. Now, her vegetarianism is actually not connected to her father's Hinduism. She, like me, just has this aesthetic thing where meat just doesn't seem like food to her. And I could really relate to that essay where she says, meat is taboo because it horrifies me. Sometimes even fake meat horrifies me. And I feel the same way. Like, those um, burger patties called Beyond Meat or something like that. Ooh, they're just way too meat-like for me and yeah, I can't take it. <laughs> I'm fine with other people eating meat and Samira feels the same way. It's so personal and individual. Um, other people eat what you want but don't try and make me eat meat because <laughs> I don't want to. 
In the essay on appropriation, there is this passage. Even within the context of multifaceted American culture, respect is complicated. What feels respectful on the part of the person taking on a practice might not feel respectful to the person whose culture is being taken on. In this sense, appropriation is always in the eye of the beholder. There were lots of things that really made me sit up and think. Lots of food for thought in this collection, that's for sure. Next is a collection of short stories called Like Smoke, Like Light. It's by Yukimi Ogawa, who is a writer who lives in Tokyo and she writes her stories in English. So she doesn't speak English, she just writes in English. And only recently have her stories been translated to Japanese. So in this collection, uh, some of the stories are set on an island where uh, the majority of people have uh, colored skin or patterned skin and only a few people are plain. And there's discrimination. The plain people are discriminated against. Uh, there are also androids in this society and they have a certain social status that is above the plain people but below the colored, colorful people. Uh, some of these stories are not set on that island and they're more like drawing on Japanese folk tales. They're all uh, a little bit fantastical, uh, really original kinds of ideas and settings. They seem that way to me anyway. And I thoroughly enjoyed this collection. Yeah. And next up is a comic book. So based on the Archie comics, this is Jughead. I read volume one, uh, it collects six issues, and in this version, Jughead is asexual. The story is written by the Canadian cartoonist, writer, journalist, Chip Zdarsky, and the illustrations are by Erica Henderson, who is well known for her Squirrel Girl comics, and so, Betty in Jughead in this series looks a lot like Squirrel Girl to me, uh, except she doesn't have the big tail. Jughead uh, keeps either, fall, either falling asleep or going into a faint or something where he has these really wild dreams. So scenarios where I don't know, he's with pirates, or he's time traveling, or uh, sort of a version of Game of Thrones, you know, something like that. The real thing that is happening is their school has been taken over with a new principal who's hired a bunch of new teachers, and they are really strict. Everybody's getting detention, they have to work really hard. Their textbook for example, world history, why America is always right. And the teacher says, class dismissed, for next time read chapters 7 and 8 15 times. Jughead comes through as a hero time after time, uh, but he is a hero who does not like to be touched. He is an asexual character. This is a whole bunch of fun like to see the ace representation and I recommend it. Now last up, this is the best book that I've read in the last week. Blew me away. I listened to the audiobook of And Then She Fell by Alicia Elliott. This is a novel 
Alicia Elliott is a Mohawk from the Six Nations in Ontario, and her previous book was a collection of essays, A Mind Spread Out on the Ground. I highly recommend that too. Now in this one, she's got uh, a young mother, her baby is six weeks old, uh, Alice is Mohawk, but she married a white academic, so they are living in Toronto, and things are not going well for this uh, young woman. Her baby is extremely fussy. She's crying all the time. Alice is sure that her baby hates her. And the whole physicality of new motherhood with the uh, cracked and bleeding breasts and um, what's happened to her vagina you know, through the birth and having to get stitched up, all that is viscerally there. And Alice's mental health is not good. It's not so much postpartum depression, it's more like postpartum psychosis. Whoa! Uh, increasingly, she's, no, she's not, she's not sleeping and she's getting more and more paranoid. And the story is told in first person. So you're inside her head and it feels claustrophobic. It's not a comfortable place to be. And yet I felt that Alice was a very sympathetic character. So she can recognize that there are microaggressions and overt racism, but the paranoia is there too. So just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you, you know? So well done. Now, what Alice is trying to do is retell the Haudenosaunee creation story. And uh, it's Sky Woman who fell and created Earth. So, and then she fell, there's the title. She's got a really snarky kind of uh, voice in the way that she tells the story. We get snippets of it. Uh, and I love that, it really reminded me of the way that Leanne Betasamase Simpson writes. Um, but things are, it's like they're building up to a head. And then there's this dinner party with a bunch of academics. Uh, her husband is on the tenor track, uh, wants to move up. And he's a white scholar of Mohawk. There's just so many layers of issues of, that are explored so well in this book. But as I said, it builds up to something that uh, you could say f makes it fall into more of a uh, horror slash science fiction slash fantasy. Uh, is it time travel? Is it alternate universes, you know, something along those lines. Oh, I was so impressed, so impressed with this novel. Whoa. But not easy, not emotionally easy to take, just so you are prepared. That is it for what I've got to tell you about today. I am going to end off. So the outro, you're going to see some scenes from the Light Up Festival parade in Ladysmith. Stick around if you're interested in what Canadians do in small towns, like put lights all over tractor trailers and um, vintage tractors and whatnot. <laughs> it was, we had a great time. Plus, uh, the weather. I love the mild weather on this island. You know, in Edmonton for winter parades, you know, it can be minus 20. It, it was above zero. <laughs> it was great. Uh, so, once again, 
Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate hearing from you in the comment section down below. Tell me about stolen, tell me about uh, fermented foods. Are you a fan? Uh, do you have comments on any of the books that I've talked about? Yeah, let's talk. I'll see you soon. Bye for now. Dance group, holy